All right, welcome this afternoon and thank you for joining us for Healthcare Consumerism 101. I am Brandy Pardo and I'm a senior account executive here at Apex. I'm Rogan Chumborn. I'm an account service representative. Awesome. All right, so we have a couple housekeeping things that we need to go through before we start. Yeah, during the duration of the webinar, you will be in listen only mode. Uh, if you have questions or comments, you can use the chat box to the right. Uh, for audio, you can dial in or use your computer, and then all the presentation slides and any flyers you might see are in the materials tab. That's cool. Yeah. Thanks for letting us know. All right, before we jump into the agenda, I just want to let you know today that some of the plan designs that you're going to see are for educational purposes only. So these are not plan designs directly suited to your group, but just for educational purposes only. All right, so just kicking off the agenda, we're gonna talk about the benefits terminology 101, my plan and how it works, pre-tax dollars, the FSA and the HSA, and good consumerism. All right, so benefits terminology. This is kind of where everybody gets hung up and understanding all of these benefits. So who is the member and who is the plan sponsor? The member is the employee of the group. So if you're an employee, you are actually the member or participant. The plan sponsor is the company to which is providing the health insurance plan for its members. Premiums, premiums are amounts paid for the insurance policy. Co-payments are cost sharing. So it's usually a set amount of funds to specified services or medications. Deductible is that first dollars out of pocket, which is the member's responsibility or the participant's responsibility. Coinsurance, after the deductible is met, the coinsurance is that cost share between the member and the plan sponsor, and it's usually in a percentage amount. Out-of-pocket maximums, these are limits on how much the member is completely responsible for in one given plan year. Preventive care, of course, is that preventative medicine or that care that you get annual screenings to detect possible future health risks and intend to help avoid such risks. And then qualifying events. Now, qualifying events are usually outside of open enrollment. And those qualifying events can be like marriage, divorce, death, um, gain or loss of coverage or adoption. Most plans will have a 30 day window to which you can give that information for that qualifying event. But this is something again, that's outside of that open enrollment period and making those elections. All right, so we're just gonna dive right into a plan. So today we're gonna talk about two different plans, a prefer preferred provider organization plan or a PPO and a high deductible health plan or HDHP. So a PPO is usually paired with a flex spending account or an FSA, and the high deductible health plans are paired with the HSA or the health savings accounts. So let's just dive into these different parts of the plan. First is the deductible. So in this particular example, the deductible for the PPO is 1500 and the deductible for the high deductible health plan is 3500. The out-of-pocket maximum, which if you go back to the terminology we said is how much a member is responsible for in one given plan year. So for the PPO, it's going to be $3,000, and on this plan for the high deductible health plan, it's $7,000. Now what you see in between there is the coinsurance. So for the PPO, once you've reached that um, deductible of $1,500, you've got a 20% coinsurance up to that max out-of-pocket. So the 20% is what the member is responsible for. The 80% would be what the plan, plan sponsor is responsible for. The same with the high deductible health plan, the deductible is 3,500, that coinsurance is 20% to the out-of-pocket max of 7,000. And then down here, you'll see the copay. So for a PPO plan, copays, and it reads as a copay on the plan, on that plan document, on the high deductible health plan, there's that caveat. So you have to have reached your deductible, that 3,500, before the co-pays or the co-insurance kicks in. Now we made a cool little chart here that kind of shows you from ground up explaining how those dollars work. So for the PPO plan, those dollars would work. You'd have to pay that deductible, which is the 1,500. 
once you reach the 1500, the coinsurance and the copays kick in to that 3000 out of pocket maximum. After the out of pocket maximum, it's covered at 100%. Now, what you have to know in the PPO is that your copays for medications and your copays for doctor's visits are not included in that $1,500 deductible. But for the high deductible health plan, it's always first dollars out of pocket. So you're not gonna see those copays or um, the copays on medications until after you've reached that $3,500 deductible. Once you've reached that, then the coinsurance and copays kick in to that 7,000 out of pocket max to where it's everything is covered at 100%. Are you with me so far? I am. I know, it's a lot. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna dive just a little bit into how a major claim is paid on the PPO plan. So this is the PPO plan. You've got a $5,000 surgery, $1,500 of that goes to the deductible, because remember the deductible is 1,500 and then the out of, um, out of pocket max is 3,000. So then the balance from that $5,000 surgery minus the deductible of 1,500, Yes, minus the 1500, that balance is 3500. So your 20% coinsurance of that 3500 is gonna be 700. And then the plan sponsor is gonna be responsible for 2800 of that. Adding that 1500 to the 700, you're gonna get 1900, is that right? Nope, 2200 of your $3,000 deductible. But on a high deductible health plan, it's a little different. All those first dollars are out of pocket. So you've got a $5,000 surgery, 3,500 is the deductible, your balance is gonna be 1,500. This is split the same way, the 20% coinsurance. So of that remaining balance of 1,500, you're gonna be responsible for that 20% coinsurance, which is $300. And then the plan sponsor is gonna be responsible for the 1,200. So adding that 3,500 plus the $300, that's $3,800 of your $7,000 out-of-pocket maximum. Now we know that these can be kind of confusing, um, but a lot of times you're really not gonna see unless something major happens, all these on the high deductible health plan. Yeah, and and Brandy, why would you want a plan where you're paying $7,000 out of pocket compared to maybe 3,000? Well, that's a good question. So how do you know what plan is right for you? I always kind of tell people the best thing to do is kind of do your due diligence before the open enrollment gets here. You know, mark down all the healthcare that you've consumed over the past year and how much your medications cost. So for someone who yourself is young, maybe just coming off your parents' insurance, you really don't utilize healthcare. I mean, how many times do you go to the doctor? Once or twice per, for preventative. <laughs> preventative, Yeah. if we're lucky, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so maybe preventative care and a doctor's visit for a cold, yeah. right? So because you're healthy, you don't see the doctor very often, you don't have any maintenance medications, and with the high deductible health plan, you can throw some money into that HSA account and kind of bank that. Maybe that high deductible health plan is gonna be something that's right for you. But take someone who might be diagnosed with diabetes and they go have their A1C checked on a monthly basis and they have to see their doctor for you know, regular checkups or have that diabetic medication that they've got to get refilled a lot, they're really going to want those copays. They want those copays to kick in first. Um, the copays for the doctor's visits, the copays for those medications that they're paying for. So that PPO plan is probably looking a whole lot better for them because there are copays associated versus having all those dollars out of pocket firsthand. So our suggestion is just always, you know, throughout the year, take an account of how you spend or utilize your healthcare in those dollars in medications and doctor's visits, and then decide before your open enrollment period, what kind of plan is gonna look best for you. All right, on to our favorite topic. Yes, pre-tax <laughs> dollars, saving yourself a bit of money. Uh, we're gonna go over a PPO and a flex spending account uh, and a high deductible health plan and the health savings account. So we'll go over the FSA or the flex spending account first. These are to be paired with your PPO plan. Uh, these are gonna help you save money because each payroll you will have a deduction. These are pre-tax dollars and they can help you uh, pay for medical eligible expenses. Uh, these could be co-pays, co-insurance, co deductibles, 
uh, over-the-counter medication, dental and vision costs. Um, the IRS is the one that determines what these medical eligible expenses are. Uh, and you can find a list of these things online. Um, and then these accounts are use it or lose it with two caveats. You can either have a rollover amount or uh, an extended usage period of two and a half months. The plan sponsor is the one that chooses this and it's one or the other. My quick question. Yep. So if I have an FSA and I leave my employment, do I take those FSA dollars with me? You do not. Those dollars stay with your employer. Okay, good to know. And that is a difference between the FSA and the HSA, uh, the health savings account. Now this goes with a high deductible health plan, an HDHP. Uh, again, these contributions are pre-tax, saving you a bit of money, and you can use these on eligible expenses, again, set by the IRS. A uh, health savings account works more like a bank account, um, and the contributions you set at the beginning of the plan year can change throughout, whereas the FSA, once you set that, you have to keep that until the next plan year. Um, the HSAs are triple tax advantage, so you're not taxed on your contribution, you're not taxed on interest you earn, and you're not taxed on the money you spend on the medical eligible expenses. Um, again, it's a bank account, so if you have a certain amount of funds in this uh, HSA, you can use that money to invest. Um, and there's no user or loser rule. This is your money, whether you're the one that puts the money in or if it's your plan sponsor, that becomes your money. So you get it year over year. Um, and if you leave that company, it, it stays with you. That's cool. So another quick question. Mm -hmm. If I invest funds and um, those funds are gaining interest and all that good stuff, and then I have something big medical come up, can I pull those funds out of investments and put them back into my HSA account to use for those medical expenses? You can, and they're still not taxed. That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah, so we were talking about the contribution amounts. Uh, these are set year to year, again, by the IRS. Uh, for FSAs, the 2024 max contribution is 3,200. Uh, that rollover amount that we talked about is 640 this year. And then for HSA, if you're an individual contributor, it is 4,150. For family, you double it, so 8,300. And then there's a catch-up contribution. That's for people age 55 and older. You get an extra $1,000 just added to that amount, so 5,150 or 9,300. Very cool. What happens when I retire? Yes, when you retire. So the HSA, you can take those funds out when you're 65, and there's no penalty, but you do get taxed for whatever income uh, tax bracket you're at at that point. If you're to pull those funds out earlier than that, there's a penalty and the tax is included. Good to know. But I can find all these guidelines on the IRS website. Yes. And that's where you should go. All right, so being a good consumer, what are some examples of being a good consumer um, when choosing services that are costly both to the plan and to the member? Here are three examples. So freestanding imaging centers, which you can utilize for x-rays, scans, CT scans, and ultrasounds. Freestanding sites for lab draws, which you can use for any diagnostic blood testing. And freestanding surgery centers for surgeries that are non-emergent and can be scheduled. So like that rotator cuff surgery or that knee replacement surgery. Um, all three of these things can be utilized just by asking your physician for that order. So again, if it's a non-emergent situation and your doctor says, hey, I think you need to have rotator cuff surgery, you can ask your physician for that order and find that low cost um, center with the best care by using that order and hitting that freestanding surgery center. There's an example here on this slide with Northwest Radiology. This is just one of those examples for that freestanding imaging center where you can get online and look at their pricing. They're very upfront with their pricing and you can see the difference between that high cost, maybe hospital system pricing for the imaging is gonna be different from that of that pricing rate that Northwest Radiology carries. All right, so I know that we talk about keeping our costs down. One of the key things that um, I like to talk about all the time in member meetings is that going to the doctor or utilizing your telemedicine access is always gonna be your first line of defense. You know, we all go on vacation and the first thing we do when we get on vacation is get sick. If we have access to telemedicine, that's like the quickest and easiest thing and it's the most least expensive, especially when we're 
out of town and not in our general network area. Um, the other thing we can utilize maybe is a um, healthcare clinic that's associated with our plan. Not everybody has them, but when they're there, they're there to keep the costs down. It's no cost to the members out of pocket. But which do you think costs more, going to urgent care or the emergency room? Emergency room. For sure, the emergency room. So we know that emergency room visits are going to be thousands of dollars versus maybe getting to the urgent care where it's going to be hundreds of dollars. Um, we know that there's probably urgent care all over, maybe even just a city or so away, or getting to that Walgreens or CVS clinic um, that's just down the road. Utilizing that urgent care services in the evening or on the weekend versus trying to get to the emergency room in a non-emergent situation. Now, as always, if you're having heart palpitations or signs of stroke or, you know, you really just can't breathe or things like that, that you know emergent situation, you should absolutely go to the emergency room. But for a sinus infection or something like a UTI, which is easily detected with a test, you should try to hit those urgent cares. And a quick thing on that, that informational flyer and uh, other informational flyers for what you can share with your employees can be found on our website. Uh, so feel free to go there and find those. And if you need help finding them, please reach out to your Apex contact and they can help you find those. Great plug. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we'll go over utilizing your carrier's websites. At the bottom, you see five common carriers we find here in Indiana. Um, all of them have apps and websites that have a ton of great information for you, the member. Uh, you have your direct member information on there. You can get your explanation of benefits, which we'll go over more in a minute. Uh, a lot of carriers are stepping away from those typical paper IDs. Mm -hmm. So you can get a virtual ID on these websites and apps to have it in your pocket. It's very nice. Um, you can find in-network facilities and physicians to help you save money on your services. Um, and this is an important thing for employees to know who their uh, ass assistance is in gaining access to these apps and websites because it has so much information for them. Well, and I typically, if I we get calls from members or anybody looking for that information, where's the best place to get that information? It's right on the back of your ID card. <laughs> right on the yep. back of your ID card. Yep. And we don't think about that because it's in our wallet all the time, mm -hmm. but typically that customer sayer service number or the claim service number is right on the back of your ID card. So utilizing those is, is probably the best bet. Absolutely. So explanation of benefits or EOB. Um, these are documents that you're going to receive from your insurance carrier, and there is a lot of information on them. You're going to have data service, your member information, your total charge, network discount, what your co-insurance is, deductible. Um, and this is the document that's going to tell you what you're actually paying for your service after it's been processed through insurance. And although there's all that information on it, they're very nice, and they put a little box that says, your responsibility or what you owe, um, and that is the amount that you should be paying that provider for that service. Absolutely. And then that links to what? The bill that you get from the provider. Yeah. In, in a perfect world, those should be the exact same. The amount due on your bill should be the same as what you owe on your EOB. Um, so it's important to look at that data service, uh, the charges, the adjustments, that network discount, so that you know that the bill from your provider is correct to the amount that you owe them. And if it is not, uh, you may have to call the number on the provider bill. Uh, they'll go to their billing department and you can let them know that you have an updated EOB. They can help you get that submitted or reach out to your insurance carrier so that they can submit it for you. Same with the EOB. There's a number on there to call your insurance carrier to have them submit that EOB again to the provider. Um, as well, if you just need help understanding what all those numbers you're looking at really mean. Well, and a, one last thing. So what happens when I log in to get my EOB off the carrier website, but the EOB is still showing pending? That's right. So EOBs get uh, typically processed within two or three days. Um, if it says pending, that means processing has not been done, and it might be time to call that number and see what they might need from you or what's taking so long to get that processed. Um, <clears throat> and if you get paper documents from your insurance carrier, you will receive that EOB in about seven to 14 days. That's a, that's a good point. So sometimes if you see pended claims on there, it might be because that insurance carrier has sent you a coordination of benefits. 
just to see if there's other insurance out there that they should know about or anything like that. So sometimes that will pend a claim from being adjudicated correctly because they haven't received that coordination of benefits. So just being sure that you're on top of opening your mail and seeing all the things that the carriers are sending you for those claims coming through and then checks and balances with your bill and the providers. Absolutely. That was all good information. So did we have any really cool questions in chat today? So the first question is on FSA, and if you can just repeat them into the mic after I talk. Okay. So, since the employee can't take the funds with them when they leave, should I encourage employees to use the funds they've already contributed to the account? So the question is, if the employees cannot take the funds with them on an FSA, should they encourage employees to utilize those funds prior to leaving employment? And the answer to that is yes. So if you've got funds on your FSA and you know you've got some bills due, are there some medications that you can utilize those funds are, you absolutely should utilize those funds if you know you're leaving the employment or retiring or going to be leaving that FSA account just so those funds are utilized. Otherwise, they revert back to the employer um, and those funds do not go to the employee. Great question. So what are the things I can use my HSA to buy? What can't I buy using? So there's a wonderful list on the IRS website on the things that you can utilize those funds for the HSA account to buy and not to buy. There are some over-the-counter items that you can purchase on the um, for using your utilizing your HSA funds. If you get on that IRS website, we'll actually plug that website into the chat so that you can see what those lists are. But you can use them for over-counter medications. Um, there are some durable medical equipment that you can utilize HSA funds for, but please refer to the IRS guidelines on those lists as to what is appropriate for those funds. And Remember to keep your receipts because if you should ever get audited by the IRS for your taxes, you will have to supply receipts for those funds that you've used those HSA dollars on. And then we have one more on HSAs. Should I use my HSA or save it if I can afford my healthcare costs, such as for retirement? Okay, so the question is, is should you utilize the funds on your HSA or should you save those funds um, for later retirement healthcare costs? This is a, another great question and a really cool caveat. So if you have the funds available to you to use and you can bank those HSA funds, personally, I would love to dump those into a bank account to help pay for the premiums um, once I retire, um, once I'm of retirement age, I can use those HSA dollars to help pay for those Medicare Part C coverage or D coverage, the extra coverages that you pay for Medicare, where you can't use HSA dollars to pay for premiums prior to retirement. The other cool thing about that is, is let's say you use your dollars for HSA um, throughout the year because you really don't need to utilize them. And at the end of the year, you realize you're kind of short on funds and you've kept all your receipts. Maybe you've spent $300 in medications, chronic medications, you've just paid out of pocket. You can actually pay yourself back with your HSA dollars as long as you have those receipts for adjudicating if you're ever audited by the tax. I just, I do something that I just put that in the chat, the IRS list. Awesome, so IRS eligible list is now in the chat. You can look those up or utilize those and we'll link those in um, when we post the recorded online in the materials tab. Yeah, so one additional question is that this is a lot of information. As an Apex client, is there someone I can contact with questions or should I call the carrier if I have questions on the case? This is a lot of information. So the question is, should she contact the carrier as an Apex client or is there someone to contact at Apex? You have several contacts at Apex that you can contact. First off is always go to your HR because your HR director is usually the one that's gonna have the direct contact and get the information that you need much quicker. Um, at Apex, we have account managers and account executives that are more than willing to answer those questions. And then also just as a back reference, going to the IR, 
S website and getting the skinny on things that have changed. A lot of times they'll update those lists and add items or even take off items as they become ineligible. Okay, these, um, the question was, what's the difference between a high deductible health plan and a PPO with a high deductible on it? Um, that is a particular plan that's set up so that PPO still has co-pays, but is set at a high deductible, so you're reaching a higher deductible. Now, remember, co-pays for doctor's visits and medications do not track towards your deductible, um, but you can utilize the copays and stuff first on that PPO, where you can't do that on a uh, high deductible health plan. All right, so thank you for joining us this afternoon in this webinar in the Fundamentals of Health Insurance, that 101. If you have any questions later on, you can always um, tune in to APEX or send an email and we're glad to answer if we possibly can. We appreciate your time and hope that you have a wonderful day. Yeah, thank you everyone.